Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world in 25 minutes. I'm Teni Ola Shoboale on the program this week. Report says the world is headed for 2.4 degrees Celsius warming despite COP26 pledges. Plus, Poland blocks hundreds of migrants at Belarus border. We begin with the second and final week of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, which opened with calls from activists and protesters for world leaders to take more action on climate change. And despite pledges made, a new analysis showed this week that the world is still nowhere near its goals on limiting global temperature rise. Here are some highlights from the crucial climate summit. After walking thousands of miles across Europe, a giant puppet named Little Amal reached the Glasgow talks on Tuesday to raise awareness of the plight of refugee children on the front line of climate change. On Gender Day, the 3.5 meter tall Amal, named after the Arabic word for hope, delivered to the talks an open letter organized by climate campaigners Avaz, calling for urgent emission cuts and signed by 1.8 million people around the world. When we think about the climate movement, often the voice of the climate refugee isn't so clearly heard. It's not as sexy, it's not discussed on the t at, the, at the kind of like negotiating table, and it was really important for us on Gender Day that the voice of the young, um, young female refugee was heard. And so she's in a way a spokesperson for those that don't have a voice, for the children who don't have a voice in this grand negotiating table. The appeal for Little Lamal came as new analysis suggests the world is heading for 2.4 degrees Celsius of warming, far more than the 1.5 degrees Celsius nations have committed to. There is a great diversity within these updates that countries have submitted. Some have clearly strengthened their targets, like South Africa and Morocco, whose targets are close to being 1.5 degree compatible under our rating system. Others are a little bit harder to assess, like India, which announced its update last week at the World Leaders Summit. Our assessment is that that would, at most, reduce um, its emissions a little bit below what we project um, is uh, that they will reach in 2030 under current policies. And still others have submitted updates with nothing new in them, like Australia, or even worse, have submitted a less ambitious target than the first target that they put forward, which seems to be the case with Brazil. The Climate Tracker report accuses COP26 of a massive credibility, action and commitment gap. Not a single country has short-term policies in place to put itself on track towards its own net zero target. Right now the net zero targets are a good yeah, vision, imagination, but they have to be backed by action, by short-term action, otherwise uh, they are simply not credible. And that's where the big problem is. And that's where also this COP has only moved a small step forward. We heard it already. The gap has decreased through this update process only up to uh, 15 uh, to 17 percent. So we are still having a huge gap. Assuming all countries implement everything they have proposed here, we would in 2030 still emit twice as much as we should if we want to be on a 1.5 trajectory. Thank you so much. Thank you. Former U.S. President Barack Obama also lambasted leaders who will play politics to avoid Thank acting on climate Thank change, you, saying there's a dangerous lack of urgency in climate talks. So, Paris showed the world that progress is possible, created a framework. Important work was done there, and important work has been done here. That is the good news. Now for the bad news. We are nowhere near where we need to be yet. For starters, despite the progress that Paris represented, most countries have failed to meet the action plans that they set six years ago. I have to confess, it was particularly discouraging to see the leaders of two of the world's largest emitters, China and Russia, decline to even attend the proceedings. And their national plans so far reflect what appears to be a dangerous lack of urgency, a willingness to maintain the status quo uh, on the part of those governments. And that's a shame. We need advanced economies like the U.S. and Europe leading on this issue. 
But you know the facts. We also need China and India leading on this issue. We need Russia leading on this issue, just as we need Indonesia and South Africa and Brazil leading on this issue. We can't afford anybody on the sidelines. Scientists have said crossing the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold risks unleashing far more severe climate change effects on people, wildlife, and ecosystems. While leaders say this is still possible, climate activists like Vanessa Nakatsu of Uganda and Greta Thunberg of Sweden say the meeting is showing too little evidence of progress. Leaders continue to open up new coal power plants, construct oil pipelines and frack gas without paying attention and listening to the voices crying out for help because of the destruction that is happening. That leaders have failed to understand that we cannot eat coal, we cannot drink oil, and we cannot breathe so-called natural gas. We must demand that our leaders treat the climate crisis like a crisis. We must demand that our leaders stop holding meaningless summits and start taking meaningful action. Campaigners and pressure groups say they were underwhelmed by the commitments made by governments during the COP26 conference's first week, many of which are voluntary or set deadlines decades away. And as scientists have warned repeatedly, action is urgently needed now to help the world avoid the worst effects of climate change. Meanwhile, delegates from Nigeria were also present at the summit this week and involved in the discussions. Our correspondent Ayola Kasim reports. At a side event on Nigeria's efforts on climate change adaptation at the COP, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs says the country is promoting disaster risk reduction governance in various areas, including climate change, adaptation and mitigation measures. Gender activists and Nigerian negotiators are also pushing for more climate financing for gender in the negotiating rooms. Nigeria in particular imputed the issues of climate finance. I mean, financing for gender, and which the other member uh, countries, also other parties, also agreed. So we might not be able to get 100% what we want, but to some extent we have gotten it. More frequent floods, food shortages, drought, and increasing clashes over land between farmers and herders are some of the devastating impacts of climate change. Even with a rapid scale-up of adaptation action, climate change will still have an impact. So the risk of losses and damages from climate change is growing. Africa loses between 7 and $15 billion a year to climate change, and this could rise to $50 billion a year by 2040. President Adesina. To the president of the African Development Bank, adaptation is Africa's main priority. The African Adaptation Acceleration Program is Africa's bold solution to climate adaptation. Let's show our support for Africa by providing the $12.5 billion needed to meet the financing target for the program. Goodwill, equity, trust, and support are critical. Let's deliver that for Africa. At the end of the day, leaders commit to a shift towards locally-led adaptation through over 70 endorsements to the principles for locally-led adaptation and over $450 million mobilized for initiatives and programs enhancing locally-led approaches. But nearly 2 billion of the most vulnerable people still with little or no protection from climate hazard, such as floods, drought and heat waves, not only are the funds announced here important, Making sure temperature does not rise further is even more important to them. As world leaders met for the COP26 summit, the United Nations highlighted the plight of Madagascans, who it says are paying the highest price for climate change. Africa, responsible for just 3% of global emissions, is seen as the most vulnerable region to climate change, as evidenced by Madagascar's droughts this year, which has left many families starving. Severe hunger has hit over 1.1 million people, with 14,000 of them one step away from farming. The situation already alarming is set to worsen by the end of the year, with the number of people in famine-like conditions expected to double. The drought has led to the complete disappearance of food sources, leaving families visibly famished and resorting to survival measures such as eating locusts, wild leaves and cactus leaves, which are usually fed to cattle. 
Vulnerable children are bearing the brunt of the crisis, with malnutrition in under fives expected to quadruple. This is what all the people in the village eat. It's been five years since there was any rain. Those who had herds of the bulls have no more because they have sold all their cattle. Look at our crops. There are no leaves growing, not even one. When you pass on the road, you can see it's dry. There are only sandy winds. Almost the hottest decade on record, Madagascar has suffered from exceptionally warm temperatures, deficits in rainfall, and unexpected sandstorms that have covered fields, left crops wilted, and harvest well below average. WFP has been reaching around 700,000 people monthly with emergency life-saving food as well as supplementary nutrition products for pregnant and nursing women and children. Moving beyond emergency support, WFP, together with the government, is implementing long-term resilience building activities that help communities adapt to the changing climate. These include access to water, reforestation, sand dune stabilization and economic support like access to micro-insurance schemes in case of crop failure. Because of the drought, because of the sandstorms, this is a new phenomenon that has manifested itself in the last couple of years. Uh, prices are uh, skyrocketing because of the uh, very poor uh, agricultural production and people do not have enough food to eat they do, not, they do not have enough money to have access to the, to the food and uh, malnutrition rates uh, are uh, augmenting. These people have not contributed to climate change, uh, but they are paying probably the highest price. In September, 3,500 insured farmers received a payout of $100 to recover losses from the failed maize crop. The payout helped families sustain themselves despite a lost harvest. WFP aims to scale up its response in southern Madagascar and urgently needs $69 million over the next six months. Since Lake Fagobini in northern Mali dried up, communities on its parched shores have had to defend their homes from encroaching sand dunes while finding new ways to make a living from the degraded soil. More than 200,000 people have had to abandon their traditional livelihoods since the river started to disappear following catastrophic droughts. In the 1970s, the region around the northern Mali's Lake Fagobini was a hub for trade and fishing, agriculture, forestry, and livestock. The lake, which was once one of the largest in West Africa, used to be fed by annual flooding from the Niger River. It started to disappear after catastrophic droughts in the 1970s, forcing more than 200,000 people to abandon their traditional livelihoods. All this area was covered by water. Then, the water receded and trees started to grow around the lake. Then the trees started to disappear and people grew crops where the trees used to be. During the first rebellion, displaced persons arrived. They destroyed the forest and once the forest was gone, sand dunes formed. Now, he and other inhabitants of the formerly lakeside villages west of Timbuktu have to walk long distances to find water for their livestock and build barriers out of sticks in an effort to keep the dunes at bay. According to the UN climate body, the shrinking population of Leifa Guibine is set to come under further pressure from climate change. In the village of Bintagunu, the advancing dunes have buried the schoolyard and cracked the empty building's foundation. This is a school for almost 400 students. 400 students, that's an entire generation. A lost generation, a generation condemned to flee or to be recruited. According to a 2016 study, in the African Journal of Aquatic Science, efforts to boost resilience by restoring Fagwebine's wetlands and the area's role as the breadbasket of the Tumbuktu region
have been derailed by waves of conflict, most recently a years-long Islamist insurgency. When foreign dispatches returns in just a moment, we bring you highlights from the Expo 2020 in Dubai so far. Please stay with us. You're still watching Foreign Dispatches on Channel's television. Thousands of migrants were seen this week at Belarus's border with Poland. Poland says it has stopped attempts by the large group to enter the country and has accused Belarus of pushing migrants to the border. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki visited his country's border checkpoint with Belarus where thousands of migrants were gathered to show support for extra security forces deployed there on Tuesday. On Monday, Polish authorities braced for further clashes with people attempting to breach the border crossing as some migrants attempted to break the razor wire fence using logs and spades. At least 2,000 migrants were said to be stuck at the border this week in freezing conditions. Poland and other European Union member states accuse Belarus of encouraging illegal migrants from the Middle East, Afghanistan and Africa to cross the border into the EU in revenge for sanctions slapped on Minsk over human rights abuses. The EU has called on Belarus to stop instrumentalizing migrants and says it's preparing new sanctions against the country. Our aim is to bring home clearly the message to the authorities of the countries where the migrants um, um, come from uh, that this is a dangerous trap, uh, that uh, people are being lured by the uh, regime uh, in uh, Minsk um, and they're being brought to Belarus and pushed towards the uh, EU borders uh, um, at their own risk and they're facing a really dangerous situation there. The United States has also called on the government of Belarus to immediately halt its campaign of orchestrating and coercing irregular migration flows across its borders. We are concerned with disturbing uh, images and reports uh, emanating from the Belarus-Poland border this weekend. The United States strongly condemns the Lukashenko regime's political exploitation and coercion of vulnerable people and the regime's callous and inhumane facilitation of irregular migration flows across its borders. We call on the regime to immediately halt its campaign of orchestrating and coercing irregular migrant flows across its borders into Europe. As long as the regime in Belarus refuses to respect its international obligations and commitments, undermines the peace and security of Europe, and continues to repress and abuse people seeking nothing more than to live in freedom, we will continue to pressure Lukashenko and will not lessen our calls for accountability. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko's government, which is backed by Russia, denies manufacturing migrant crisis and blames Europe and the United States for the plight of the people stranded at the border. Humanitarian group accused Poland's ruling nationalists of violating the international right to asylum by pushing the migrants back into Belarus instead of accepting their applications for protection. But Poland says its actions are legal. Bringing Expo 2020 Dubai to a global digital audience. The number of virtual visitors has amounted to 12.8 million since October the 1st. Nearly 2,000 government leaders have been at the Expo, with more expected to visit the pavilions. Our Dubai correspondent, Mayowa Adegoki, reports. <laughs> Coming to the Expo is like visiting the whole world, only that it's in one location. The theme for this year's Expo is connecting minds, creating the future. And organizers are keen on making this happen. It's the first Expo in the Middle East, South Asia and Africa region. Dubai is calling it the world's greatest show. So far, I will say that I'm wild. The place is so amazing. I visited the fountain and the Kenyan pavilion and other different and beautiful places. So I will say that whatever even I was looking for, I'm, I'm more than amazed. 
I want to know about different countries, about their traditions, their cultures, so I can learn more about it. So I have an idea about different countries, experience. I'm like very interested to see the different cultures because each of the pavilions has their own individual style in a way and uh, yeah, it's very diverse so I really like it. There have been over 2.35 million visits and a staggering 5,610 official events in the first month alone. It feels amazing that we've been able to bring the entire world to Dubai. It's the biggest global event since the COVID-19 pandemic and will daily bring the world together through various programs, events and exhibitions. A country like Uganda has already signed $650 million worth of, of, of investment deals and that's just in the first couple of weeks of being open. Um, a country like Malaysia has signed $2 billion worth of investment deals in the first two weeks. Uh, we've had the UAE uh, announce its commitment to carbon neutrality by 2050. We've had our UAE Minister of Space uh, talk about the, uh, the ambitions of the, U of the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, in the next five years in space and the collaboration that we're doing with countries around the world like Israel. And so there's just this overwhelming uh, breadth of geography, um, an overwhelming sort of amount of activity that's going on every day. And, and that's just a snippet of what you, what you could experience uh, if you come on site. Of the 192 country pavilions, UAE and Saudi Arabia are quite popular, with Saudi attracting over half a million visitors already. Of course, I'm going to say the Emirates one. Uh, when I visit it, I get really emotional. Hi, we're from Italy. Uh, we are in our honeymoon, so we just get married and we have decided to come to Dubai for, I mean, one of the reasons is the expo. And we are loving it. Our favorite pavilion until now is the Saudi Arabia one. Saudi Arabia, it was very great. And also I love uh, Netherlands. Netherlands? Uh, yes, mm. Netherlands. And Germany also is quite good. Sun up to sundown, Expo site is a buzz, especially with entertainment. Tonight, fashion designs and Uju voices showcase at the South Africa Pavilion. If you walk around the expo, you're going to see pavilions from all over the world. And what that does is it puts us alongside the rest of the world. So as far as connectivity goes, it's nights like these that allow us to showcase our fashion or our music or our opportunities that we have within the country alongside everybody else. al Kebulan is where visitors come for the African dining experience. Feedback is great and um, we have so much people coming in to discover what African food is like and um, to see the contemporary twists and how playful it can be and try some ingredients for the first time ever. Uh, I started with Chef Coco so we have a French chief over 30 years and uh, he invited me with TGP International and uh, I find here really wonderful. Really here we want to present the beauty of our continent in a plate. Of course, what is travel without food? From our cable line at the Dubai Expo, Maya Wadigoke for Channels Television. 
Well, this is where we say goodbye till next time. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on ChannelsTV.com. Thank you so much for watching the program. I'm Tenyola Shobowale. Stay safe.